is really, really green out here. I mean, I know I'm in a forest, but this is uncharacteristically green. <laughs> this has been one of the best monsoon seasons. That was bear poo right there. It's been one of the best monsoon seasons we've had in a very long time. So what's up guys? Welcome to a hopefully good birding episode. So I'm out in my favorite haunt, uh, an area of the Gila Forest, it's about 15, 20 minutes from my house. And I'm looking for red faced warblers. Oh, I just heard one. All right, we're gonna set up shop. That, that's what we're looking for. Right up there. And one over there. Well, I'm just gonna kinda stake out here under this tree area. Wow. I was still in lightning shooting mode. I don't know if you guys care about lightning, but last couple of videos I've done, gotten some pretty awesome lightning. And uh, I was definitely using this lens to help make it happen. Wow. The sun still has, it's still too early. The sun hasn't come up over the, we're kind of in a canyon right now. Four hundredth of a second. ISO 2000. That's fine. I don't care if my ISO goes high. Especially in conditions like this with uh, rare birds around. Do what you gotta do to get the shot. All right, so this isn't gonna be a vlog. I've already done red faced warbler vlogs if you wanna see that. You can check it out. I just wanted to come somewhere nice in the forest, and if I see one, I see one. And uh, but mostly, I want to talk to you guys about this. So um, this is probably my most requested review uh, since I've had this lens for like to last I don't know six, to eight, ten months. I don't even know how long. I had it for a little while now. And I just haven't done a review, but on the upside is this is more of a long-term review now because I have shot just about everything that I've done in the, in the past uh, year or so with this one to 500. And let me just, let's just get a couple of things out of the way real quick. Um, first thing is this is not sponsored in any way, shape or form. I bought this lens with my own money, uh, very painstakingly saved for much longer than I wanted to. <laughs> and made my own sacrifices so that I could get this lens. So everything I say is my own. And also I think this lens is definitely, this review is definitely going to be more focused on uh, wildlife. Um, I, that being said, because most of the people interested in this lens are wildlife photographers. I'm also a wildlife photographer, but I'm not solely a wildlife photographer. If you're new to the channel, I definitely do a lot of wildlife here, so you can definitely check out my wildlife playlists and such. But uh, I also am a landscape photographer and an astrophotographer and a time-lapse photographer, so I do a lot of different things for my photography business. And that being said, I still use this lens 99% of the time for wildlife, for landscapes, even for uh, certain astro stuff, long lens astro stuff, for portraits. I mean, the compression at 500 millimeters, 400, 500 millimeters is absolutely wonderful. There's definitely something going on in that tree right there. <laughs> the problem with summer is there's too many leaves. It's really, really hard. So like I said, we're definitely going to talk about, I'm gonna show you guys some of the other things other than land, other than wildlife that I've done with this lens. But this definitely is, I still use it for wildlife more often than anything else. Well, and landscape, and landscape. 
So another thing that I want to point out in terms of me reviewing lenses, um, this isn't scientific and I've, I've, I've gotten like, I've had comments from people saying that I shouldn't say that so much. Like I say this isn't scientific. I'm just going to say it this one time. You know, this isn't going to be example shots and, and uh, testing and charts and you know, all of that stuff. <laughs> this is going to be my practical use as a, as, you know, and my experience as a professional photographer over the last however long I've had this lens. All right, I won't say that again, I promise. But on that same train of thought, basically what I want to come across, what I want to get across to you guys is there's a difference between, sorry, I'm also listening for bears because there's a lot of bears in this area. And if I see one, I definitely want to shoot in the face while remaining extremely cautious. <laughs> uh, but there's a difference between a really good lens or a lens being really good, like optically and technically and all that stuff and being really good for you. And I think that's one of the things that I try to make come across in all of my reviews uh, is that difference, the difference between it being a good or great lens and being good or great for you personally. And that's what hopefully I'm going to help you figure out. Got him. Barely. It's not, not a portfolio shot or anything, but uh, I don't care. These are like my favorite birds ever. and Just being out here and being able to see them is cool. So tried to get a little bit of video of him. It's not easy. <laughs> Handheld videos of tiny little flappy birds in dark forests is it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. Acceptable. All right, I'm rambling. So let's get into it. Let's let's go over build quality first. Um, if you're familiar with Canon L series lenses, then you should probably know this thing's built like a tank. It's rock solid. I've had it in pretty much every environment uh, and every kind of weather condition. I've had it in some rain and uh, the desert and wind and dust devils and sliding down mountains and there's a big bug around me sorry <laughs> all, all kinds of stuff and it's it's rock solid this thing is fantastic it's weather sealed that for me personally that's one of the biggest reasons why i would go with either like this or the one to 400 over um something else like say the sigma 150 to 600 contemporary or something like that but there's a lot of reasons but that's one of them you know so weather sealing for me as a professional being out living in the desert and going all the places and being in inclement weather weather sealing is important to me it's weather sealed i've had zero issues with it it's rock solid uh, i do have quite a few scuffs and marks and bruises on this thing though because i i've dropped it a few times and i've banged it again i'm not i'm not gentle with my uh, equipment uh, but that being said, I don't, I mean, I don't like bash it against things, but you know, it's, it's bumped up against trees and whatever. And this isn't really a good, that was a horrible example of bumping up against a tree. Um, you know, it's, it's fallen out of my bag a couple of times and rock solid build quality, rock solid tripod collar. This is probably the one negative that I have. And I just, I wish this is a kind of a negative for all of Canon tripod collars. I wish that uh, it was Arca Swiss compatible, like the Tamrons. So like the Tamron 150 to 600, the G2, and uh, there are, they have the, uh, the built-in collar is Arca Swiss. And that's what I use the most. I think that's what a lot of people use. It's very, very nice. Um, it would be nice if I didn't have to mount an extra thingy to here you know, to use my tripod. This is one thing that I like a lot, and that is this smooth to tight turny ring right there. So that lets you control whether it's really tight like this and it will not uh, creep on you or fall down, or whether it's really smooth 
and you can do it really fast. I prefer to pretty much always have it on the tight setting um, just because I like to know that when I zoom somewhere, if I zoom in to whatever, like 300, then it stays there. But I do like that. That was implemented with the 1 to 400 Mark II uh, on the EF version, and I really enjoy that. All right, side buttons. So we've got uh, stabilizer mode, 1, 2, and 3, stabilizer on, off, AF, and uh, focus limiter, so full or 3 meters to infinity. 3 meters to infinity is really great when you're shooting things that are in the distance, especially uh, birds in flight and stuff like that. The less you can make your lens hunt through the entire range, the more accurate the AF is going to be and hopefully the better, uh, the more keepers you're going to get. So that's nice. Uh, let's talk about the stabilizer modes real quick. So this is nothing new, I don't think, but stabilizer one is for both axes, X and Y. So that will help stabilize in all directions. Stabilizer two is for panning things. So action sports, birds in flight, that kind of thing, panning on only the X axis. And stabilizer three uh, is kind of like a sleeper mode. It's really great because it's faster so and it's faster because it when you look in the viewfinder and you have press and you're on one and two you're getting that stabilization as being active and you can see it when the image calms down and you're looking in the viewfinder you can see it you can feel it you know that it's engaged with the stabilized three mode engaged uh, it's really great because it will stabilize faster and it does that because it won't engage it also will save you a little bit of battery because it takes a lot of battery when you're constantly half pressing and constantly engaging that stabilization so if you want either the the fastest possible stabilization you can get or if you want to save battery or both then stabilizer three is your jam and it will activate the second that you press the actual shutter button to take the image that's when it will stabilize at that very last uh, instant and that's really great so those are the options uh, lens hood let's go over that real quick it's definitely a slightly different feeling material it's still plastic still rock solid I use it a lot because um, well for one anti flare and all that stuff from the Sun for landscapes um, but also too for you know lens protection I can't tell you how many times I've bumped or dropped my lens just slightly you know and the lens hood is what's uh, taking all of that damage the one thing I don't like about the lens hood and I discovered I thought I would like it at first um, when I first bought the 1 to 400 mark II. I bought that I had it pre-ordered so I had it since it came out and all the way until I bought this so I had that thing for like I don't know what five six years however long it's been out a long time over time I thought this was cool you know the they have the ability to use your polarizer so you can uh, change your polarizer without having to mess with the hood and still have the hood on so a couple of things about that like it sounds really cool but over four or five six seven years or whatever of using that uh, I've discovered that one these things fail like nobody's business and they just become completely flappy and they won't stay shut and it's just really annoying so I ended up just taping that so that's annoying it's also like there's not that many polarizing filters actually that will fit inside this with the lens hood on uh, and some of them like you have to have the lens hood on first and then stick your hand in there and then screw it in so you know it's just little stuff like that i'm nitpicking but you know people have asked me these questions before so i'm trying to be all inclusive here that's all i'm going to say about the hood it's a lens hood it's great it does its job this thing may or may not become uh, completely useless over time we'll see if they made any improvements to that all right let's talk about focusing distance that's another just absolutely wonderful thing about this lens is the minimum focus distance is um incredible so wide is 2.95 feet and telephoto all the way zoomed out 3.94 feet so um that's incredible that makes compression your best friend for wildlife and for portraits and for landscapes being able to focus as close as possible and get as much compression as possible out of your zoom lenses is like one of the best things ever. So that's where this thing has a lot of others beat. Focus speed. Uh, focus speed I haven't had any issues with. It's been super fast. It's been 
Um, again, this isn't scientific. This is subjectively, I would say, it's definitely a hair faster than the 1-400 to Mark II, which was blazing fast. I loved that lens. Even, you know, I've, I've done a lot of like sports and wildlife and stuff with this lens. And as far as focusing speed, acquisition, and then locking on, it's been fantastic. The only time when I've had issues with this hunting, uh, it's even with wildlife in these low conditions like this, uh, when I'm getting these shots, I mean, this was like basically already after the sun had gone down. I mean, it's super dark. My ISOs are astronomical. My shutter speeds are as slow as possible. And this is still locking on and it's not hunting like I would have expected with a lower quality lens. The only time that this has hunted on me really bad is when it's just completely, just insanely way too dark or uh, when I'm doing like landscape stuff, like this, these kind of shots right here, where um, it's getting towards dusk or dawn or whatever, and I'm focused, trying to focus on these mountains, and there's, there's not enough contrast for it to lock onto an edge anywhere, then it just really hunts. And in that case, um, again, that's when I'm doing landscape stuff. I throw it in manual focus, I zoom in, I lock it down. So that's kind of the only time that it's really hunted, but just on everyday stuff uh, with even birds in the forest like this, I was just shooting that, that warble over there and he was in the trees, like I mentioned, but I never lost him. I, ne I never once lost focus. It snapped right to him, it found him. Uh, it was super responsive, super fast, even when he hopped back and forth. It's just, it's great. All right, I got distracted again trying to catch another bird. There's also painted red starts out here. I'm just going to put my little seat down and sit down and finish this up. All right, that's better. Nice and comfy. It's really cloudy, so we're still in monsoon season. That's definitely why I wanted to do this video earlier in the day rather than later, because uh, it's gonna get stormy soon and I'm gonna go get me some more lightning shots, hopefully. <laughs> All right, let's let's talk about the last thing um, image quality so this is probably the most important to a lot of people it's what a lot of people want to know about the image quality it's amazing it is again subjectively better than my what is that if that's the red start I think that's the painted red start. They're mocking me because they know I'm trying to do a video and not photograph them. All right, whatever. <laughs> if I get another, sh if I get a painted red start shot over here, I'll, sh I'll show you guys. All right, so image quality. I that's the painted red start. I told you they were, I knew they were out here. Very sneaky. All right. <laughs> I feel like the birds don't want me to talk about image quality. I don't know why. Image quality is amazing. Subjectively better than my 1-400 to Mark II, which was incredible. And when I say amazing and incredible, I'm, I'm talking about uh, comparing them to other zooms and stuff. Like, the image quality is not as good as uh, a big prime, you know? a 400 2.8, uh, 500 f4, uh, 600 f4. Those types of lenses, especially the newer versions of them, the Mark IIs and the Mark III's and all that, uh, those lenses are in a league of their own. And, you know, it's not even worth comparing something like this, which, you know, although the price seems astronomical to most people, you know, $2,300 or whatever it is for, for, for this, uh, it's nowhere near the ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars that some of these big whites cost, and there just there shouldn't be like you shouldn't be wanting to compare those because they're just so different. So outside those few uh, exceptionally expensive and exceptionally rare cases for lenses, uh, this one to five has been 
basically one of the sharpest lenses that I've ever owned. Um, it's, I have had zero issues with image quality, even when cropping in. And of course, a lot of that has to do with the body that you're using as well. Um, but even like on my R6, my RP, um, even, you know, anything that's not the R5 and 45 megapixels, I, the image quality, I've had zero issues with the rendering of the contrast and uh, the sharpness and the colors that come straight out of this lens just make it an absolute joy to shoot with. I just, I can't reiterate how content as a professional photographer I am with using this lens for professional and personal purpose, uh, purposes. <laughs> I almost said purposes. I just got back from my whaling, uh, my, wh my whale uh, watching photography uh, tour in uh, the San Juans and it was amazing. I'm, and I'm planning for my next one. So if you guys are interested in uh, whale watching and, and uh, birding, seabirds, puffins, all that kind of stuff, you should definitely get my newsletter and um, let me know if you're interested in that. It'll be next May probably. So that's a tangent and a random plug, but I do a lot of wildlife tours and stuff like that's one of my favorites very looking forward to that one coming up on the note of image quality i've talked about this in my other videos so if you're new to the channel then this might be a new conversation from you uh for you from me but if you're not new to the channel then you will know where i'm coming from when i tell you that you really really need to manage your expectations when it comes to image quality it doesn't matter if you have a cheapo like my 800 millimeter f11 or a 150 to 600 or a 1 to 400 or this lens or a prime f4 600 you know fifteen thousand dollar lens none of that matters if you don't manage your expectations and if you try to beat physics or if you don't understand physics if your subject is too far away in our case of birds uh, if the birds are, no matter what size they are, the smaller they are, the farther away they are, the more difficult it is uh, on so many levels to acquire focus and to get sharp images. If your subject is too far away, you're shooting through more atmosphere, uh, you're shooting through, if you're in the daytime, you've got heat haze. Um, all kinds of things in physics are against you. And it doesn't matter if you, if you go into the attitude of, I spent $2,300 on this lens and it should be amazing. And everybody, the reviews say it's amazing. Why are my images soft and all of this stuff? Well, it's probably because you're too far away. I'm, I'm talking like if the birds are more than 30 to 40 feet away from you, you're going to start seeing a degradation in image quality. And that is physics. And you cannot win against physics you need to get closer. And is that easy? Absolutely not. I mean, why do you think I'm out here in camo and, you know, I spend, a there he is, the red face warbler just came right down again. I spend hours out here, days out here waiting, you know, wildlife photography takes effort. And all I'm trying to say real quick is do not be so quick to blame your gear uh, for soft images because it may not always be the gear's fault it may just be physics or it may be you know your technique or whatever so that's all i'm saying is manage your expectations for image sharpness if you're close to your subject within a decent acceptable closeness amount i when i'm shooting birds i really like to be between 20 and 40 feet you know uh it's not so close that it's messing with them and it's not so far away that i can't crop in and still get a really decent image same thing with wildlife, you know, like this. If you're out, I shot this, uh, these buffalo in Tetons with this, uh, and the pronghorn and this pronghorn with this uh, 500 millimeter, and they were just too far away. It doesn't matter that it locked focus, but when you crop in, the image just falls apart. Now, is that this lens's fault? Absolutely not. That's my fault for not being able to get closer. And, but, I chose not to get closer because I'm respecting boundaries of these animals. I could have maybe put it in crop mode or I could have got out my 800, but even in, in images like this, even in situations like this, it's too far away. You know, this moose was way too far away. This bear was way too far away. And you know, you just, sometimes you have to accept the image for what it is and know that 
you're seeing this wildlife, you've captured it, the memory is there, the image is there, accept it as an environmental portrait landscape type thing, you know, for the wildlife. And don't be so quick to destroy or bash your image quality of your lens or your camera body or whatever. All right, that was a little bit longer of a rant than I wanted, but it's just extremely important that you, I, I, I want people to understand that. A couple more things about the um, image stabilization that I forgot to mention. So with the IBIS in the R5 and the R6, Canon, I think, has said something like seven stops. I'm not sure if that's right, but I think I remember seeing something about six or seven stops. Again, subjective, non-scientific. I don't think I've ever gotten anything that good, but I've definitely gotten the normal like four to five stops. And I've been very happy on the still side with being able to slow that shutter speed down and handhold this. I mean, with landscape stuff, I've handheld this at like 15th of a second and still been able to get usable images. So at, at you know, like 100 millimeters. So that's really impressive. And with wildlife stuff I've too, I've been able to back it down to like, you know, a hundredth of a second or something at 500 millimeters. And as long as your subject isn't moving that much or at all, hopefully, <laughs> then the image stabilization for the still side is great. For the video side, I love it. Every, if you guys follow my channel, and if you haven't, you should go watch some of my other wildlife vlogs. Um, every bit of footage, wildlife footage that I've ever shot on my channel with this lens, uh, all of this stuff that you're seeing right now has been handheld with this 1 to 500 uh, and the IBIS on either the R5 or the R6. Those are the two things that I've, the two cameras that I film my wildlife with. And I just cannot tell you how much I love filming video with this lens, especially wildlife. I cannot get enough of it. I cannot stress how amazing the image stabilization is with the lens, especially combined with IBIS and hand holding. It just makes it such a treat to be able to, and then you combine that with being able to film like with 4K 120, like in the R5 or 10, 1080p 120, just fil filming in slow motion uh, with these cameras, handheld, wildlife. It is a complete joy. But on the still side, again, I would, I would say subjectively that I'm easily seeing four to five stops, uh, maybe even more, maybe six stops occasionally. I think it's one of those things where the lens, you know, the lens manufacturers, the Canon definitely kind of is doing best case scenario and maybe overstating that just a little bit. However, that doesn't, I still think it's amazing. I still think, especially with the IBIS, uh, the things that I've been able to handheld, handhold shoot both stills and video have just blown my mind. And I'm, that's one of the things that makes this one of my favorite lenses is how small and light it is. And the fact that I can handhold, I can do my video, I can do my stills. It really reduces my need for a tripod unless I'm doing long exposures or, you know, whatever. Um, I never film wildlife with a tripod. I just, with this kind of stuff, I just don't need to. I don't feel that need. So very stoked about that. Future Brent here. So I've just been editing the video uh, and I forgot to mention, and I know that this is a sore subject for a lot of people. I forgot to mention the aperture. So I just briefly, very briefly want to go over that real quick for those people who like to complain about the aperture here. Yes, it's slow, 7.1, it's not great. Uh, it's much better, however, coming from using something like this, which is my F11, my 800 millimeter. <laughs> so it's all about relativity. If you're coming from something faster then I mean, if you're coming from something slower like that, uh, then 7.1 is gonna seem great to you. <laughs> if you're coming from a big white prime or even the one, 100 to 400 uh, Mark II, something like that, which is like 5.6, I think, then there's a difference. You're gonna notice a difference. So the key things are, it's too slow, you can't get good shots, um, that's horse crap. I, you absolutely can. And um, the other thing is, it doesn't let in enough light or you're gonna have to use your ISO like crazy. F5.6 
NF 7.1. Um, they're only two, two thirds of a stop away. It's not even a full stop. So, you know, on my R5, on my R6, I have zero issues. I, I, I don't even notice, you know, and in practical use, you're not going to notice. Um, from something like that. If you're coming from an F4 or an F2.8, yeah, you're going to notice. It's going to be slow. But concerning, can you still get background blur, you know, like this? At 500, the compression is going to be your friend here. So it's not going to be the aperture. It's going to be the compression and the distance to your subject. You get close to your subject and you put 500 millimeters on that thing and it will blow your background out. I've had zero issues with that kind of thing. Again, like I say in a lot of my videos, know your physics, know your limits. Uh, if you're shooting something super far away, the farther away you are from your subject, the less background blur you're gonna get. And that doesn't matter if you're shooting on an F7.1 or an F5.6 or an F4 or an F2.8 or an F1.2. The farther away you get, the less blurred your subject is going to, the less blurred your background is going to be from your subject. It's just plain physics. All right, so that's all I want to say about the aperture. Yes, it's 7.1. Yes, it's slower. Yes, I wish it was faster. Do I care? Absolutely not. That's just me personally. If that's something you care about, uh, then that's something you're gonna have to take into consideration of is the lens worth the price point to you for being an F7.1. Oh, one more thing, teleconverters. I have not, I'm, I'm planning on doing a, a separate video about teleconverters with this lens. Uh, and maybe I'll compare it to the 800. I haven't done that yet. However, the teleconverter, there is a caveat. You have to, because of the way the RF lenses are built, the flange distance and all that stuff, um, you cannot use the teleconverter. You have to have it at 300 meters or 300 millimeters or more. Otherwise, you will physically hit the elements uh, on the lens. So. That's a bummer that you can't zoom all the way out and that you have to be at 300 or more. Uh, I will, like I said, I will do a separate video on that in the future. Um, and then of course, that just reminded me because of the aperture, you know, you put a teleconverter on there, you're gonna be stopping down from 7.1 to F9 uh, with the minimum aperture on the teleconverter. And that's kind of a bummer. So just keep that in mind if that's important to you. Like I said, for me, I couldn't care less, um, but you're not me and I'm not you, so <laughs> keep that in mind. All right, back to regular Brent for the rest of the content. It is getting really dark out here, like within the last 30 seconds. Uh, I feel like I need to get out of this canyon before this storm system um, comes right over me. So I'm gonna wrap it up. So I've given you my thoughts on the technical aspects of it, again, non-scientifically, but I've gone over all of these things that reviewers go over that people typically wanna know about a lens. Price. This lens is expensive. It is on average more than $2,000. Um, this is really where the good versus good for you comes into play. Yes, on a technical level, this lens is better than anything in its class. It's class leading. It's better than any of the zooms I've ever used from any of the other brands that I've tested, Sigma and Tamron and uh, Nikon. Um, this lens is better than them all. I haven't tested it against the new Sony stuff, so I don't know there. But when price is concerned, I cannot speak for anyone but myself in any other situation but my situation. I cannot tell you if that price is worth what this lens offers versus getting the one to 400 Mark II uh, used on eBay with an adapter. Um, all of that works amazing. That's what I used the first couple of months I had my mirrorless cameras. Um, I can't tell you if it's worth getting like the Tamron 150 to 600 because of the, the price difference. I mean, that lens is 60% less than this lens. You know, I can't tell you if it's worth uh, the 800 millimeter, the F11, which gives you way more reach, but that lens has got a lot of its own problems. I love that lens, I own that lens, I've done a very, very extensive review on that lens and I've used it for quite a few wildlife vlogs. So if you wanna see more on the 800, if you want me to do a comparison directly between those two lenses, uh, let me know. I may think about it, although it's not going to go well for the 800 
for the exception of price and weight. All that being said, again, I can't tell you what's gonna be good for you. I can only tell you how good this lens is. Yes, you should know by now this lens. The 1-500 to is an amazing lens. It's my favorite lens of all time. But does that mean you should buy it? I don't know. I don't know your finances. I don't know your, your seriousness on your level of photography. Um, I need this lens. I can justify this lens. I saved up for it. Uh, I knew what I was getting into financially and I made it happen. And I, it was worth every penny for me because I've already made more than its share back. I've already made that cost back uh, with my business. Okay, it is getting just stupid dark. I need to get out of here. So if you have any questions about anything that I went over regarding this lens, how I use it, um, anything that I missed on the technical level that you wanna know, leave those in the comments below and I will definitely answer them. Hit that like button if this video helped you out because that's the best way you can help me out and I super appreciate it. I love you guys if you stuck around this far. You're amazing. I know I talk a lot and that's it. I will see you in the next episode. It is tea time. Time to get away from this rain. Check out my uh, check out my my stuff. You know my presets and all of the stuff that helped me out. My workshops. Super stoked on the workshops got coming up. Balloon Fiesta, uh, another San Juan Islands workshop. Puffins. Super stoked on that. Newsletter link down below. All right, I'm done. I'll see you in the next one.